be specific. Okay. Okay, everybody's going to have to stop talking so I can hear the question, so I can answer the question for the benefit of everyone. If you got A, great. Sit there and zip it. I recognize the whole, like, the integral and then the variable is upper limit. Right. And then I know that that's related to the second fundamental theorem, right? What do you mean, second fundamental? Which part of A are you talking about? Are you talking about finding G of negative 3? G prime. G prime. Oh, G prime is that. G prime, what? There are two parts to part A. You have to find G of negative 3. Are you good with that part? Yes. Okay. So find G prime of X. G prime of X would be, what's the derivative of 2X? Two. Two. Plus, what's the derivative of an integral? The function with the variable limit plugged in. That is it. Okay, so then with negative 3, you just plug in negative 3 to your x. Yes. Okay, yes. and then if you have f of negative 3. That's from the graph. Okay, and on the graph, the f. Where's negative 3? What's its y value? Zero. G of negative three. Okay. G of negative three is equal to two times negative three plus the integral from zero to negative three of f of t dt. Okay. So we've got negative six plus. Well, actually, let me change that to minus because we do not. Uh, we do smaller value to bigger value. So I'm going to flip over my integral. Okay, negative 3 to 0 of the graph. Well, the integral of f is the area under the curve on that graph. So from negative 3 to 0, we don't have that function, but what is that shape? It's a fourth of a circle. So the fourth of a circle is its area would be uh, one fourth times the radius. Its radius is three squared. That's where it goes. Pop, pop. I thought maybe that's what the duplicate. Yes, yes, yes. Don't forget, and and this is I've seen it. I've had this question from several of you. How do I find the integral of something when I don't know the function? Well, they give you the graph. The integral is the area under the curve. You've got to know that relationship cold. Okay, you've got to know that cold. All right, B. Are we good with B? Are we good with B? Okay. <laughs> Determine the x-coordinate of the point at which G has an absolute maximum. Okay, so absolute maximum. First of all, we've got to identify local maximum. Local maximum um, is where the derivative changes from positive to negative. Well, f is the derivative. Um, or actually, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, where the derivative equals zero. Let, let's identify that first. Okay, so where the derivative equals zero, the derivative g prime of x is 2 plus f of x. We want to know where that's equal to 0. Well, that is where f of x is equal to negative 2. So f of x is equal to negative 2 at, what is that, 2 and a half, 5 halves? Okay, that is a potential uh, absolute maximum. Okay, anytime we do absolutes, You've got to consider the endpoints as well. So we've got to plug in uh, negative 4, 5 halves, and 3. Mm, well, according to this, they don't even consider, they don't consider the endpoints. I'm not quite sure why. I'm really not sure why they did not consider the endpoints here. It just says one point for considering where g prime is equal to 0, one point for identifying the 5 halves, 
and one point for your answer with justification. I really cannot explain why they did not consider the invoice. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that what we can do if, it, if there's a point that it doesn't give us? Yes. 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 No, you should not guess that that is 5 over 2. Um, I mean, most of the time you can assume that it's going to be either a whole number or a half value. Um, but no, I would not guess. I would look at that as this is a line. Um, it has a slope of negative 2. So um, it would hit halfway between 2 and 3 right there. Uh, but you should not you should not necessarily assume that. But most of the time it is the truth. Um, I really do not understand why they do not consider the endpoints. I mean, I understand why they don't consider three because you're decreasing from that maximum point. Um, but technically, you should compare negative four where it starts. Does it tell us where it starts? Mm. Well, you it, it never hurts to, to do it. Um, it doesn't say anything about it, but I would consider it because it asks for an absolute maximum on a closed interval. You're supposed to check the end points. Um, anyways, part C, find all values of X for which G has a point of inflection. All right, so... A function has a point of inflection where? When the second derivative is equal to zero. Okay, yes. And not only where it's equal to zero, but we have to remember that there has to be an actual change in signs. Okay, but we're going to start with where it equals zero. Well, we have the first derivative. So the second derivative of g would be what? Uh, zero plus f prime. Okay, the second derivative of g is f prime. So we want to know where that equals zero. Yes? Yes, but since we don't have a function, we're, we don't really have to worry about it being undefined. Well, take, well, negative three there would be a vertical tangent line. Okay, um, so where would the derivative of what we're looking at equal zero? Where would the derivative of what we're looking at equal zero? At zero. Why? I have a question. Is that not a shock point? It's not a shock point. Well, the Right, but it, that, that's where Sydney's point comes into, into play. It could technically be undefined. The biggest thing is that it changes signs. Okay, it would change signs. Why? Because the function changes from increasing to decreasing. And that's the only place where it changes from in, increasing to decreasing, meaning its derivative would change from positive to negative. Uh, making that an inflection point. Okay. Um, that is the explanation for C. And D. We need to go over D. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Find the average rate of change. Are we good with that? Okay. Uh, the second part says there is no point C between negative 4 and 3 for which F prime of C is equal to that average rate of change. Explain why this statement does not contradict the mean value theorem. Here's where what Sidney was just talking about comes into play. It does not contradict the mean value theorem because yes, this function is continuous on that interval, but there are two places where it's not differentiable. Okay. It is not differentiable here at negative 3 because that would be a vertical tangent line okay, because it comes up really sharp here and then changes. Uh, that's a vertical tangent line, so it's not differentiable there. It's also not differentiable at 0 because it's a, uh, let's call it a semi-sharp point. Um, it's not
not smooth. Okay, the curve is not smooth there. So even though it's continuous, it's not differentiable at two places, so you cannot apply the mean value theorem, even if the other conditions uh, are met. The mean value theorem is the one that says um, um, the slope of the secant line is equal to the slope of the tangent line at some point on an interval. And then we also had the mean value theorem for integrals, and this is the one, uh, that's the one it's really talking about here, the average value. Um, there's a point somewhere where the uh, y value is equal to the average value of the function on that interval. So we've got mean value theorem for derivatives, mean value theorem for integrals. This one's about integrals. Where the y value of the function is equal to the average value of the function over the interval. And that's what part, the first part of that one was talking about. Find the average rate of change. Or no, hang on. Find the average rate of change. This one's talking about the derivative. This one's talking about the derivative. Because the average rate of change and not average value. You're going to keep those two things separate in mind. And that's not what I'm Average rate of change, that's the slope of the secant line. Average rate of change is the slope of the secant line. Um, so, the value theorem says that there is a point where the tangent line has the same slope. Mean value theorem for integrals says that there is a point whose y value has the same value as the average value of the function. Okay? Average rate of change, average value. Derivatives, integrals. Both mean value theorem. Not confusing at all, right? 